Welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Extracellular Vesicle Club. This is an event uh, that we hold weekly from the International Society for Extracellular Vesicles. And it's been a great pleasure to collaborate with Socrates, which is the Singapore Society on Extracellular Vesicle Research um, in many of these sessions. So we have these um, every few months and it's always nice to hear about some of the wonderful science that is coming out of Singapore. Um, and so today is no exception and we have a very nice talk lined up for you. And I would like to just introduce um, the co-hosts today, the co-hosts who will also be the moderators, and just remind everybody that um, during the presentation, um, you will be on mute. But at the end, um, we can unmute you, and you will be able to interact with our speaker today. Um, and just please put your questions and your comments in the chat box. Um, so now, I would like to turn this over to Wei Xiang To and Min Lei, who are uh, present in Singapore, and they um, are going to be co-moderating, and they will be introducing our speaker now. So over to you, Wei Xiang. Yeah, thank you. Min Lei, you want to introduce? Yes, it's my pleasure to introduce Prof. Go Wong Chu, who is Professor of Pharmacology and Medicine at the National University of Singapore. Um, he's a very respected clinical clinician scientist who's leading the efforts at the Cancer Science Institute to develop novel therapeutics for cancer, particularly head and neck and lung cancer. Um, he has conducted uh, multiple clinical trials for new treatments of cancer. Um, in his lab, um, they focus on discovering novel drug targets through functional genomics and molecular dissection of disease mechanisms. His lab has also been working on uh, proteomic analysis of circulating extracellular vesicles as a resource for diagnosis and cancer biology. Um, part of the work that both go present today um, is accepted for publication in Terranostics. Congratulations, Prof. Go, and we look forward to your talk, to your exciting sharing. So thank you very much, Professor Min, for that very kind introduction. And I'd like to really start by thanking the organizing committee, Professor Kenneth Whitwer and uh, Wei Xiong, for the opportunity to really interact with this group of amazing experts in the field of extracellular vesicles. Um, and uh, today I was hoping to uh, use one or two projects uh, that we have been uh, working on in our laboratory and a clinic uh, to try and illustrate the potential of extracellular vesicles, which I'll call EVs for short, uh, in translational cancer research as uh, in, in diagnostic biomarkers, as well as uncovering biological function um, in lung cancer. Um, so I'll just go on to the next slide. So at, really at the risk of uh, preaching to the choir here, uh, we know that extracellular vesicles are really nano-sized membrane-bound vesicles. They are released by almost all cells, present in al almost all body fluids. Um, and opposed to the fact uh, that people used to think that they contain unwanted garbage released from cells, they actually ca carry bioactive molecules within and on the surface. And these constitute uh, proteins, lipids, um, um, nucleic acids, um, and they are formed by an orderly manner. At least exosomes are formed in an orderly manner through endocytosis into endosomes, budding into uh, multivescular um, 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 bodies, and then released via exocytosis into the circulation. Uh, we were interested in exosomes, uh, but we, we, we really know it's very difficult to distinguish these from uh, microvesicles that are, are released. Now, the, um, the, the question then is why mine plasma for EV carried proteins? And there are several reasons that we might uh, consider. The first thing is that if we were to look at free plasma proteins, we might miss uh, certain unique proteins that reflect important aberrant pathways and mechanisms in tumor. Um, we might also uh, uh, consider the fact that plasma contains a high abundant proteins that make it uh, very difficult to deal with uh, with regards to signal noise ratio. So um, the Fundamental, fundamentally, there's a biological role for these uh, 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 EVs, and they regulate uh, physiological processes, but can be um, can be uh, exploited for uh, pathological uh, processes as well. So these EVs can not only um, affect 
uh, surrounding cancer cells or distant cancer cells by a, in an endocrine or paracrine manner by, uh, a, and serve as an intercellular communication uh, pathway, they can also influence the uh, phenotypically normal uh, cells around uh, the, the body, including endothelial cells resulting in angiogenesis. They can mediate uh, immune evasive action. They can remodel the extracellular matrix uh, and they can influence the development of metastasis uh, in cancer. So they are very important uh, as a, a source for, uh, in, for understanding biological science in cancer. Now, we thought that one project that could be useful would be to develop uh, an EV-based uh, diagnostic panel, at least for lung cancer. And why do we choose lung cancer? Essentially, lung cancer still remains the top cause, uh, cancer cause of mortality um, in the world, uh, far outstripping uh, colorectal cancer, which is number two. And previously, there have been two large randomized studies. There were others, of course, but these are the two largest uh, randomized uh, clinical trials that showed that their low-dose CT scans can be used for lung cancer screening in a high-risk population. So the two studies include the Nelson study and the National Lung, lung uh, Study uh, trial. Um, in the National Lung Study trial, which is a large study, um, this study essentially uh, looked at about over 50,000 subjects uh, who had a high risk of developing lung cancer. And by that, they mean uh, people who smoke more years um, and, we didn't, and did not stop within the last 15 years. And in, through this low-dose CT scanning, they showed that there was a reduction in mortality in these patients of about 20%. Um, and this therefore made it sort of like a, a, one of the standards for, for uh, screening of lung cancer. However, the issue there is that through low-dose CT as opposed to chest uh, x-rays, you will pick up small nodules in the lungs. And these small nodules largely would be benign. And therefore, there's a high false positive rate of about 96.4%. Um, translated into words, this means that about a, for about 1,000 uh, patients who are screened about uh, and, and are found to be positive, about 17 uh, percent, 17 of them actually underwent uh, invasive procedure like a needle biopsy and so on, which led to quite considerable uh, morbidity. So the other problem is that uh, whilst this is considered a high risk group in, in East Asia, about 40 percent of non-small cell lung cancer do not smoke and uh, and because, and because of this, there's a high, high uh, prevalence of the EGFR mutant lung cancer. And these are not part of the screening group. So you will miss this group of patients if you were to use low-dose CT scan in the way it was developed. Now, so we thought that it, we could use a simple plasma-based EV-derived uh, 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 prote protein diagnostic panel to help with this process of screening. So if we want, one were to look at a population of uh, people uh, it, uh, who are considered high risk and you, you want to pick out the, the one in red who has lung cancer, the conventional way is a low-dose CT scanning and then you get a group of people who are considered positive and some of them in yellow will be false positives, but all of them will undergo biopsy and finally you screen and detect one. However, if we were to inter, uh, intercalate uh, an exosome-based uh, or EV-based diagnostic panel, basically you will reduce the number of people who are considered positive. And in doing so, you will save some of these uh, in individuals from undergoing an invasive procedure uh, like a lung biopsy. So in order to do this, we uh, worked out a workflow as follows. The uh, initial discovery phase, we had a training set where we had patients uh, who were in the early, uh, early uh, diagnosis of lung cancer, stage one and two. And then we had a group of people with a late stage three and four lung non-small cell lung cancer. And then we have a group of overtly uh, healthy uh, individual subjects. We pulled their plasma into three groups. We uh, lyse the plasma and uh, under uh, lyse the, ex the, the extracellular vesicles. We did triptych digestion. We derived the peptides and then we subjected the uh, 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 the, the samples 
to an eye track proteomic and platform of analysis using uh, mass spectrometry. And then we had the uh, a, a group the sort of peptides that are differentially regulated or differentially expressed between the control groups and the, the cases. And then uh, these were then looked at using uh, data mining, use uh, public data mining uh, databases. And on through ontological studies, we then shortlisted about 56 uh, biomarkers, uh, which we took up to the next phase of uh, development, which is the, um, this is the, this, after the discovery phase, there's some validation phase. So here, what we did was that we looked at the expression of individual proteins, the 56 of them in each individual using Western immunoblotting in the three, again, a different, a sample set consisting of controls, early and late stage non-small cell lung cancer. We uh, look at the differentially expressed proteins and through this analysis and uh, biological plausibility and literature search, we then uh, verified these uh, six shortlisted targets, which we took to the third stage of biomarker validation, where here we use ELISA to, uh, because it's more high throughput in a larger sample set here now, or again, and as, a different sample set is another orthogonal uh, cohort. And uh, we then started to look at the, um, the performance of each of these individual biomarkers using receptor operator characteristics analysis. And through this, we enriched uh, a panel of four uh, proteins, which we could then use for uh, early non-small cell lung cancer detection. And these uh, tables, these graphs here actually show the performance of these three, the, the, uh, at least the expression of these three, these four um, biomarkers. One is catalase, CXCR4, SFTPB, and uh, SOD3. Now, SFTPB has been uh, found uh, to be quite useful in early diagnosis of lung cancer by another group in uh, Canada in the by, by studying or measuring this protein in the plasma. So, so this provide some kind of validation to our uh, biomarker analysis. The next step, of course, is to figure out whether you need to do this in the EVs or can you do it, can you just measure plasma um, circulating proteins and looking at the, at the ROC curve characteristics for the early stage non-small cell lung cancer and all non-small cell lung cancer, can see that the uh, EV derived proteins perform much better than free floating uh, uh, plasma uh, uh, proteins in the in the plasma, and we also uh, compared this with the conventional tumor markers, including uh, CA125, CA cipher 21-1, commonly used in the clinic for um, monitoring lung cancer, and clearly uh, it it sort of performs better using our the EV uh, biomarkers. And the, the last thing we did was to derive an algorithm using uh, machine-based learning and conventional uh, statistical card analysis and so on. And we developed a, a, an algorithm and showed that just using three biomarkers instead of four, as, so we, we, we left out SOD3, we could achieve a high uh, uh, a high performance rate of, uh, of differentiating the cases from normals. The next thing we did then was to use this uh, algorithm and, and the, the individual biomarkers and study them with regards to other uh, cancers in order to show that it's specific to lung cancer. So here we have a, a, a sample set of breast cancer specimens and plasma specimens with colorectal cancer and nasopharyngeal cancer. And you can see that these the, the, the three biomarkers or four biomarkers do not uh, distinguish a breast, uh, these three cancers from uh, healthy normals. So uh, the next step in the uh, development was to show what happens to these biomarkers after uh, the patient under, who has an early stage non-small cell lung can cancer undergoes surgery. And so you can see at, before surgery, we can pick out um, a, a high expression of, uh, of the three uh, individual proteins in the EVs, um, in the plasma. And then about one month to two months after surgery, when the patient returns to the clinic, you get a repeat measurement shows returns to almost uh, normal, healthy uh, population. And this is the same for the, the three biomarkers. So suggesting that um, it, after surgery, 
the expression of these proteins actually go down, uh, which may mean that these are truly derived from the tumor. So based on this, we are currently doing a prospective clinical validation of the efficiency of this EV-based uh, panel to predict patient risk. And to do this, we would then need to look at what we call high-risk patients who are attending the respiratory clinics, undergoing bronchoscopy, uh, undergoing low-dose CT, and, uh, and then we can um, collect their plasma uh, for, for our biomarker panel analysis. And we hope that eventually we'll be able to then look at the uh, performance of this diagnostic biomarker panel with regards to the positive predictive value, the specificity and the sensitivity, and whether we truly can use this to enrich the patients uh, who are screened positive by low-dose CT. So, so far, uh, a preliminary analysis shows that we can pick out the malignant from the benign uh, uh, subjects uh, using these three biomarkers. So, um, this study is still ongoing and hopefully we'll see some results uh, in the near future. The next thing I'd like to do is to shift gears and speak about another project that we did to try and understand um, the, the cargo protein cargo carried by on these uh, EVs in the plasma. Um, and what they can do uh, with regards to tumorigenesis. And we focused on, on a, a protein called FAM3C, um, and, and this is found in the circulating tumor-derived extracellular viscose in non-small cell lung cancer, and this work is currently in press. So what we started to do first was to look at a panel of three lung cancers, H2, uh, H5201650, and 827, which is an EGFR mutant lung cancer, and, com and, and do proteomic, eye, eye track proteomic analysis as we did in the previous uh, project, and compare the protein output uh, with a benign fibroblast uh, derived from lung tissue. And we could uh, distinguish about 1,369 1, proteins carried by the EVs, which uh, differentially um, um, uh, expressed in the tumor, in, uh, in the lung cancer cell lines, of which 709 of them are commonly found in three, uh, are, are overlappingly found in three of the uh, cell lines. Um, and we then ranked this according to the expression level and looked at the, uh, the various high top hits of these proteins. And we picked out FAM3C as one of the uh, possibilities for further uh, analysis. The reason why we picked out FAM3C is that previously it has been known to be a, media, a secreted cytokine uh, from tumor cells and found to be high in various other cancer types. And it can uh, sort of mediate uh, EMT um, um, characteristics in cells. So we looked at public databases of expression data that uh, can distinguish between, that have data that uh, are present from a tumor and adjacent normal tissue. And we found that in uh, lung cancer, the adenocarcinoma and the squamous cell carcinoma, there's quite a uh, differentially upregulated FAM3C compared to the surrounding normal tissue. And more importantly, the expression of M3C seems to portend a poorer prognosis uh, in the, the patients uh, in whom a, a higher expression was found. So back to the uh, cell lines, we have a panel of cancer cell lines, and we studied the expression of M3C and showed that uh, there is a variability, com uh, there's considerable variability in the expression of M3C. Some are high, some are low, but in the uh, normal tissue, of course, we don't find it. Um, and, uh, and we found that we went then went back to our plasma uh, sample from patients with non-small cell lung cancer and a healthy cohort. We uh, analyzed FAM3C and showed that there was differentially upregulated expression of the protein in the EVs from these patients, uh, plasma. Um, and studying the matched tissues, we could see that in these patients uh, who express a high FAM3C, uh, the, the, the tumor tissue actually has a higher, it indeed confirms that it's derived from the uh, tumor tissue uh, as shown here in the adenocarcinoma cohort and the uh, uh, squamous cell carcinoma uh, patient here. The next thing is to understand whether FAM3C has a phenotype. And here we chose three uh, cancer cell lines, one 
highly expressing FAMTC, the SKMES, one a low expression, 2170, and one intermediate. In the high expressing uh, 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 cell line, a knockdown of uh, FAMTC led to reduced um, migration, uh, reduced invasion, and reduced colony formation using um, these scratch assays, uh, metrigel invasive assays, um, and, uh, and soft agar gels. So 2170 overexpression resulted in the opposite. So you have a higher, more aggressive phenotype uh, seen after overexpression with, of M3C. And in the, uh, the intermediate expression cell lines, uh, overexpression resulted in what we saw in the, um, in the first experiment where there was, in, there was a reduced um, uh, uh, aggressiveness. Uh, whereas overexpression resulted, no, so overexpression resulted in more aggressive phenotype, knockdown resulted in a less aggressive phenotype. Now, then we did a rescue experiment where um, the, the A549 cells uh, were first um, depleted with, of uh, FAM3C and again uh, showing that uh, knockdown results in less invasiveness and less uh, uh, migration. But re after adding recombinant FAM3C, you see the, the, the phenotype is rescued. So you have increased um, uh, uh, migration and increased invasiveness. Now that is good uh, in vitro, but uh, how about in vivo? So in this experiment, again, A549 cells were manipulated by uh, overexpression. Um, and, and, and let me see, I just cut out. Let me remove this out of the view. Okay, and we have a knockdown and, uh, and we have uh, overexpressing cells and we injected uh, these uh, in three different conditions into new mice and assess the lungs for uh, tumor metastasis. And you can see uh, that after this experiment, the, we, on the harvesting the lungs, you can see the overexpressing cell lines actually populate the lungs with large tumor burden of lung cancer compared to the knockdown, which had fewer tumor forming colonies. This shows that um, um, overexpressing FAM3C led to a highly malignant phenotype uh, in, this, uh, in these mice. Um, looking at the uh, immunohistochemistry sections of these uh, three sets of animals, you can see that FAM3C overexpression results in really a dense um, 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 tumor um, colony formation within the the the, the lung cancers uh, in the, within the lungs, and this is statistically significant. Um, and it, using higher magnification, you can see that the spots, the the red areas here, which are expressing cytokeratin, are actually cancer cells, which are you know are basically uh, tumor forming colonies, which are which are interspersed throughout the entire lungs of these animals that uh, uh, receive the overexpressing cell lines. Um, then uh, the next thing to, to do is to understand whether these uh, FAM3C mediated effects are actually mediated via EVs or could it be just the free protein that uh, uh, is, uh, is responsible for this. So again, we chose the moderately expressing A549 cells um, and we did an experiment where um, we collected um, the supernatant and, and separated out the tumor-derived EVs. And then we uh, uh, incubated these EVs in the parental cells. And then we had another um, um, experiment where the FAM3C over expressing A549 cells. Again, we collected the EVs from the supernatant. And these EVs were then uh, incubated again with the parental unmanipulated cells. And looking at the results here, we can, of course, we also uh, tag these uh, EVs with cell glow so that we can actually follow or track the EVs into the cells. And here you can see that these three uh, conditions showed that uh, if you can appreciate here, there will be um, increased EV uptake into the cytoplasm of the parental cells that receive the EVs that, from the overexpressing, FAM3C overexpressing cells. Um, and phenotypically, um, overexpressing um, EVs, uh, EVs derived from overexpressing uh, FAMPC cells actually have a higher uh, uh, biological aggressiveness compared to the controls. So this proves that essentially 
the effect of fan 3 c is mediated via uh, EVs um, and less so from a free protein. Not shown here was the fact that we did several other experiments um, where we proved that the fan 3 c was not mediated via uh, leukemia inhibitory factor, which is one of the receptors said to be mediating fan 3 c activity. We did this by knocking down the LIFR and showed that that had no effect whatsoever on the uh, phenotype of the cancer cells. Now, next thing we did was a more uh, uh, ambitious experiment where we wanted to show that uh, using these EV, EVs from uh, FAM3C high expressing cells, they could actually prime the distant tumor tissue for the for tumor colony formation. So how we did this was uh, we had a, a group of new, new mice where we injected them with three uh, different situations. One, a PBS, which is the control, and then EV from a control uh, 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 cells, uh, A549 A cells, supernatant uh, tumor-derived EVs. And then from the cells that, um, the supernatant of the cells that contain um, over fam 3 c overexpressing uh, A549 cells. So we injected equal amounts of these into the mice every, tw twice a week. And on the second week, we injected one uh, single infusion of A549 cells. And then we followed the, the mice for seven weeks. And then we uh, sacrificed the mice and had a look at the uh, lungs of these uh, mice. And you can see here that the in the FAM3C overexpressing cell, um, uh, the ones which receive the, 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 the EVs derived from overexpressing cells, there are increased numbers of uh, tumor colonies in the lungs. It's clearly higher. And a closer look using high um, resolution microscopy shows that um, in the areas that have KI67 high, uh, there are higher concentrations of FAM3C, which suggests that the FAM3C is active in the proliferative uh, areas of the, of the tumor. So the, the final question we want to ask is how was FAM3C uh, mediating this? And we already showed that it was not through a free drug, a free protein interaction with the LIFR receptor. So uh, the first experiment we did was to look at gene expression differential. Uh, what does FAM3C overexpression uh, result? No, what are the changes in gene expression? And we could then group the, um, the genes that are overexpressed into different pathways. And we have the EMT pathway that is uh, stands out, which is not surprising because FAM3C is known to promote EMT. We also saw an increase in the invasiveness signature, which is again, not surprising considering the uh, phenotype that we had observed. But more surprisingly, we found that there were uh, genes that were involved with the KRAS uh, signaling pathway. And looking at the, the, then we consulted the string protein database. And in the string da protein database, it allows us to understand protein-protein interactions. Uh, what are the proteins that ca can, um, uh, interact with the protein of interest. And in this, we uh, narrowed down uh, one of the inter possible interacting proteins as RELA, which is a RAS-related uh, proto-oncogene A. And um, in this set of experiments, we showed that RELA and activation and FAM3C are coordinately or concordantly expressed in the cell lines, the lung cancer cell lines. Um, we did co-immunoprecipitation assays as shown here. We showed that FAM3C co-immunoprecipitated with, REL, with RELA. And in a proximity ligation assay here, overexpressing cells with of FAM, FAM3C overexpressing cells actually co, had co-location of uh, RELA with FAM3C. So this all suggests that the protein FAM3C is quite closely, uh, at least geographically located with RELA and possibly directly interacting with it to mediate its effect. Um, the, the next experiment we did was to uh, inhibit RELA and there is a known RELA inhibitor, which is BQU57 and using increasing of concentrations of BQU57, essentially what we showed is that in the presence of FAM3C, um, BQU57 
uh, 57 does its, uh, its action, essentially it can inhibit uh, REL A. However, if you knock down or remove FAM3C, this, um, this activity is lost. And this is because um, FAM3C is required for the activity of REL A. So our overall uh, proposal, therefore, is that um, tumors that overexpress uh, FAM3C release them into uh, the EVs, which circulate in the patient's plasma and go into distant sites where the, the EVs are then taken up by endocytosis. The, the FAM3C cargo is released into the cytoplasm. It interacts with REL-A signals down the REL A, known REL A pathway, SERP and STAT3, and then upregulates genes which are related, uh, which mediate um, biological aggressiveness as we uh, saw in our experiments. So this shows that uh, our experiments do show that plasma circulating EVs are a rich source of biomarkers. Um, protein cargo in the EVs do review some diagnostic information for non-small cell lung cancer. And these proteins can be bioactive and can mediate intercellular communication even to metastatic sites. Um, finally, we are trying to do another experiment now, and this is the work of uh, Dr. Jayshree in our lab, where uh, we're trying to understand whether tumor-derived EVs can confer resistance to molecular pathway therapeutics. So previously, we had shown that uh, oncogene-addicted uh, uh, tumors, in this case, non-small cell lung cancer cell lines, when the, the cell line, when the cells become resistant or when resistance develops to TKIs, um, what happens is, is that the cells upregulate oxidative phosphorylation. And if we could interfere or in, in, uh, intervene by inhibiting OxFOS, we can restore to a certain extent uh, this uh, sensitivity to the TKIs. So that uh, was quite interesting. And therefore, now we are studying whether EVs derived from the TKI resistant cells can induce resistance and be a means of uh, causing, uh, conferring this resistance to actually a TKI sensitive cells. Because this means that when a patient develops resistance to TKIs, the cells would then influence the rest of the sensitive cells to become uh, resistance, which is a huge um, clinical problem. Um, uh, you know, which we face every day. So here we have uh, HCC 827 8 cell lines, uh, which are EGFR mutant cell lines sensitive to gefitinib, which is an EGFR TKI. Um, and if we treat the, the parental cells, or we, if we treat the cells with small concentrations of gefitinib, you can derive a gefitinib risk line, so HCC827 gefitinib resistance. And if you treat the cells with gefitinib uh, at uh, 2 micromolar, you can see that 827 uh, parental cells are sensitive, uh, but the resistant cells are, are somewhat resistant to gefitinib. Um, and if you collect the um, EVs from the supernatants of these resistant cells, you can actually uh, induce some kind of resistance in the sensitive uh, parental cells. And this is uh, this demonstrates that these EVs carry the biologically active molecules that confer resistance to the uh, TKIs. And this is seen also in the uh, soft agus uh, uh, gels. And if we also had another tumor model in a melanoma cell model where the same uh, experiment was performed. And in this case, we're using a BREF V600E um, inhibitor, vemurafinib, um, to which A375, which is a melan which is a melanoma cell line that expresses a uh, mutant uh, BREF, uh, is sensitive to. And again, uh, once we take the EVs from the uh, resistant um, um, cells and we co-incubate them in the um, in the sensitive cells, you can you can cause a phenotype of resistance. Now, staining these EVs, you can see that these EVs are taken up into the cytoplasm of the cells. Um, uh, we also showed that these resistant cells that result from exposure to the EVs from, uh, re from the resistant cells, they will result in upregulation of uh, phos oxidative phosphorylation. So here you see that there is an increase in OCA or oxygen consumption once these cells become uh, resistant or upon uh, exposure to the EVs. Um, we had a patient who was 
osimertinib resistance. Osimertinib is a third generation EGFR TKI. And we had this cell line from this patient. We cultured the cells, derived the EVs, um, and we used these EVs on a H1975 cell. Uh, again, an EGFR mutant cell, which expresses a T790M mutation. And we showed that, again, the same phenotype can be seen, that if you give the EVs from a resistance patient now, uh, cells derived from a resistant patient, you can render sensitive cells resistant. So that is kind of interesting, and we're working on the various uh, mechanistic uh, uh, implications of this and how, how, how this is actually uh, causing, mediating this effect. So with that, I will end uh, the presentation and um, hopefully you can take some questions. So I see some questions here. Okay, so okay. I, yeah. Yeah, thanks for the very nice presentation. Yeah, so uh, thanks Puncha for sharing this uh, very informative uh, presentation of your work. And uh, so let us uh, kind of like uh, start by taking some questions from the chat box. So the first question from uh, Wen Wei. Yeah, thanks again for the very nice talk. So for the EV bioactivity examination, uh, how do you decide the dose of the EV treatment by particle number or by protein concentration? Um, I believe that it was through, uh, we did of course optimize the conditions and look at the phenotype and pull out the, the, me the middle, you know, the IC50, so to speak. And it is by particle number. It's not by protein concentration. I see. I of see. course, yeah. Of course, that would uh then that would then ask the question how much per EV, I guess. And this is actually very good. Yeah, so the next question, uh, is there any differences between treating the recombinant FEM3C or the EV delivered uh FEM3C? in the EMT promoting function. Ah, okay. So this is a again a very important question actually which the reviewer asked. <laughs> so <laughs> so um I I think it was the there was a difference. Uh I think it was the FAM 3C in the EV that that pro, with, that did more than the recombinant EV. And that was what led us to uh understand that it's actually the EV package uh uh FAM3C that was biologically active. Uh, of course, recombinant FAM3C will get into the cell somehow. You know, there are various ways. It's a free protein after all. Um, but I think the effect was certainly greater with uh, with, with uh, membrane package uh, FAM3C. So for the EV treatment in the cells, does it require to use uh, a low serum or even the serum depletion? Yes, I believe we, we had to deplete the serum from because the supernatant obviously would have uh, FAM3C free circulating FAM3C in the supernatant. Mm -hmm. It is after all a, a, a secreted protein from cells. Yep. We did, we did another experiment where we tried to find out um, whether or not the FAM3C was in the, the EVs or whether it's out. I think Min helped us in the experiment. We, it's a proteinase K experiment. We yeah, showed the question here. The question here is about ABS, which is a, the serum that is often has EVs in mm. the serum uh, for, that we use for cell culture. So I guess that in your culture to produce EVs, you, you remove EVs from ABS or you uh, use serum free medium. Uh, okay, I'll I'll let uh let's see who did the experiments. Uh, Liren is online. Liren, can you ex? Uh, do you know whether we, I I believe we use a, a EV free media. Yeah, so this part honestly, I I'm not quite sure about the the exact protocol because I I'm not one to do experiments, but I believe that the I think we have tried a few different conditions and we drive to the same the same conclusion in which. Um, in the presence or absence of any sort of uh, serum deficiency, we do see the effects. Yeah, so that's the basically a short answer. But again, uh, I don't really do the experiments, so I can't give the exact answers to this. All right. Okay. Yeah. So the <laughs> next question from uh, Xu Tong. Yeah. 
Yeah, so based on the results from the first study in your talk, what would be the best target to detect if one wants to detect cancer using blood samples, EVs, biomarkers in plasma or CTCs? What, we, what would be the best target to detect um, if one wants to detect cancer using blood samples? I see. Okay, so <laughs> because uh, that, that, that's a very valid question. Essentially, there are a lot of um, um, efforts now to try and develop a diagnostic panel. There are methylation uh, uh, DNA assays, there are, there are cell-free DNA assays and so on. But I do think the jury is still out. We don't really know which one would be the best because there are no head-to-head -head comparisons. Um, they are. They all have got um, promising uh, pathways forward, and I think the most forward. I mean, the most developed currently is probably uh, cell-free DNA, which is uh, quite almost almost close to uh, um, you know application. In fact, we routinely um, study the the plasma cell-free DNA um, for 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 example EGFR mutant lung cancers and monitor it. So the question really can be answered only after, after comparison, eventually. Mm -hmm. We need large studies in order to compare which one is the better, better uh, assays, detection, diagnostic assays. Okay, so I think uh, back to the previous question on the serum. So one way we wanted to ask further if... Uh, if the presence of the FBS, even EV depleted FBS will interfere the uptake of the EV that you add. If the presence of FBS, yeah, it will interfere. I think I think probably to a certain extent, yes. But you know, it's the it's the relative concentration of EVs present versus the the free EVs, I guess, which is the the, the, you know, which which would determine the success for, of the experiment or the failure of the experiment. And I, I do think that consistently we see that uh, using uh, FBS, um, I, I will have to check whether it's depleted from, from uh, EVs, did, did anything, but clearly the phenotypes are different. Yep. Yeah, so Catherine have another question. Yeah, thanks again for the very nice talk. In the cells that were overexpressed with uh, FEM3C. It looked like the signal was brighter, but maybe not more numerous. So referring to the slide with the IF images of EV uptake. So do you quantify this signal by brightness or number of particles? What do you think caused this difference? So I don't think we, <laughs> I don't think we did quantify it with uh, brightness or number <laughs> particles. They're still quite dark. So, but it to us it did look quite clear that there were larger. Uh, there were, it certainly there was more immunofluorescence from the just looking at naked eye under the microscope. Uh, were there more together? I'm not so sure. <laughs> mm. All right. So follow up question. Uh. Is uh, related to the to the EV related biomarker for diagnosis. Any advantage comparing to the others, such as the free form biomarkers or CDC? So th that is actually quite similar to the earlier questions. Yeah. So I each of them they have uh, their pros and cons, right? You would say. Yes, I think if I were to summarize the situation in diagnostics, I think CTCs are falling off the map pretty much. Um, because of the assay variability, I, I, you know, it's hard to have a biomarker where you have like a cutoff. And why should it be that cutoff? Shouldn't it be a range? Um, and, and I think CTCs really are a bit cumbersome and there are lots of uh, ways and means of, uh, uh, of deriving CTCs. So I haven't seen a lot of um, progress, progress in the CTC field mm -hmm. currently. Yeah. Maybe Okay, so the another question by Kenner. So he's uh, wondering why you chose uh, FEM3C to do several bioactivity tests. And uh, is it able to be measured in plasma uh, EVs in the clinical samples? Right. So that's a very good question. Um, we rank, we, of course, the first thing we did was to have derived the 700 or so proteins which are differentially expressed. Then we ranked them and FEM3C is in the top 10. And we biolog we looked at the biological function of these individual proteins. Uh, there were 
some of them were interesting, but FAM3C seem to have the most um, data that suggests that there are some tumor-related uh, oncogenicity, and therefore we chose that. Uh, it wasn't the highest, it wasn't the highest uh, um, a protein that we saw. I think it's number five. Um, and then the other thing is whether we can measure them in the plasma exosomes of the non-small cell lung cancer cell. Yes, absolutely. That that was what we did in the, the experiment that I showed. We had a healthy uh, mm. patient plasma and then we had the tumor plasma. We extracted the exosomes. We found FAM3C differentially expressed. Yes. So we found that. Okay. Yeah, so adding to that, right, okay, may I also ask, right, I mean, uh, you have detected these uh, FAM3C in the plasma samples, in the in the clinical samples. Would that also kind of like be helpful in terms of the diagnosis and especially in terms of uh, predicting for cancer resistance? Yeah, so we, I, I'm not sure that would, it certainly didn't come out as the, the one of the proteins that hmm. we found as useful in the diagnosis. Perhaps it might be, but our approach was, was one of statistics rather mm -hmm. than function. So if we were to use a statistics, then perhaps other uh, proteins like SFTPB, which is surfactant, actually lung surfactant, uh, seem mm -hmm. to do better. Um, I see. It's difficult to explain this biologically because surfactant may not even be highly expressed in the tumor cells. It's probably highly, some, ex, some uh, investigators have shown that it's highly mm. expressed in the surrounding normal cells adjacent to the tumor, the cancer itself. Mm. So it's something mm. like a, a wound uh, reaction to a wound in the, mm. in the yeah. and, and that seems to be a very good uh, and specific biomarker. So again, very hard to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what could have uh, any bioactivity effect might not necessarily serve as a good diagnostic biomarker. Yes. Can, can we, I say that? Yeah. Mm. So, so also, uh, I, I'm also quite curious about your first study on these, um, the protein biomarkers. So I know that in the field, I mean, I'm not exactly in the field, but I know that uh, people are also looking into these uh, microRNA as uh, these uh, biomarkers. How would you actually kind of like, I mean, uh, assess in terms of uh, using the protein biomarker versus these uh, microRNA biomarkers? Yeah, so that, that really is an area of intense research. Mm. So there are indeed people who are very interested in the microRNA, which seems to be quite stable. We mm. feel that proteins are also stable as long as they are encapsulated. So I think one, maybe one important experiment is to find out uh, with storage conditions. Would the protein biomarker encapsulated in EVs be better compared mm. to uh, miRNA, which is in the viscose? Um, that, that probably is quite useful to know. The second thing we thought, why did we focus on proteins is that it is the effector molecule. And so the function is really downstream. Uh, whereas mm. miRNAs would influence a large, phys uh, quite a lot of uh, biological uh, pathways. So we want to be down, drill down really at the effector uh, molecules rather than the upstream um, mediator mm. of multiple actions. Uh, so that, and of course, we didn't want to compete with the miRNA. <laughs> <laughs> So that is uh, uh, interesting, yeah. So, so I mean, having said that, right, can, can you also comment on uh, the three protein biomarkers that you have found? Have you actually go further to try to understand their functions in uh, cancer? Yes, we have done quite extensive literature search. So catalase is, uh, is influencing ROS, uh, reactive oxygen species, and is found um, in many cancers, not only in lung cancer, so it seems to be sort of like a general marker of probably inflammatory state in, in cancer. So it, it has got some um, cancer promoting function. Um, the other one is SFTPB, which is lung specific. So we believe that this one gives a lot of specificity towards uh, 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 lung, right? compared, lung cancer compared to other cancers. Um, and then the last one is CXCR4, of course, which we know is, uh, is in, involved with uh, metastasis and so on. So these are clearly of biological function um, in cancers and especially non-small cell lung cancer. 
we have started to look at tissue sections with regards to expression. Uh, we found quite a lot of uh, controversial, you know, it doesn't gel. It certainly isn't high in some types of lung cancer. Um, but as I said, some of it is actually higher expression in the adjacent normal tissue compared to the tumor itself. So still a lot of work to be done in uncovering what, what actually, why are these proteins high? Um, what determines or regulates the difference in expression? Why are they encapsulated in the EV? Why would the EV be better than a free plasma uh, circulating protein? Quite a lot of questions which yeah. quite likely we don't, don't really know. Yeah. And, and do you also share some results that uh, you show that uh, these are three biomarkers were able to differentiate the lung cancer from the other cancers? Uh, did, did we, yes, we did. We showed that okay. this, yeah, we, we did. It could okay. dif at least between breast, um, colorectal, and nasopharyngeal cancer. I see, we, I see. We chose these three because we had a lot of plasma samples for these three. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, Wen Wei has uh, another question. So, for your EV ELISA assay, uh, do you lice the collected EV then run the ELISA or? You capture the EV on ELISA plate and then detect the EV proteins. Hmm. Uh, it's a technical I, question. Yeah, it's a nice technical question. I believe we did the latter, the former. So I believe we mm. lysed the uh, the, mm. the EVs and then we ran the ELISA. And, and I think that that is how it was done. So that, that is a question which which probably alludes to the fact is the protein on the surface or is it inside the EVs, right? I think that that's the crux of this question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so, yeah, I think, uh, so do we have any oh, more hi. questions? It, yep. Hi, if I'm allowed to, right, uh, may I just ask, uh, ask a few questions? In fact, I just have one question. It can be broken down into two two main parts. Um, so first is regarding the three markers panel that is shown. I, I think the result is very clear that we can separate the, the early cancers against the healthy, and they give a strong enrichment from um, the plasma data. But the question is, right, can we actually predict, um, as, at least on the pen itself, uh, a separation of high-grade against low-grade tumors, or can we predict for prognosis against these lung cancer patients? Do we know whether certain patients will be responding earlier, better to, to treatments, or will certain relapse? Okay, so that question would be a prognostic question. In other words, uh, currently we're talking about diagnosis, but can the biomarkers be prognostic? I think we haven't gone to that level yet because we need a large sample size in order and with sufficient follow-up to be able to um, analyze that. Um, the second uh, issue here is, uh, so, okay. Yeah, I, I guess that, that pretty much answers your question, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so when it comes to the second part, well, well if, if say the, the bioreactivity of sort the markers that you have presented earlier is true, so will adding FEM3C into the three markers allow us to separate those that will likely go through metastasis or those? Or, or will adding ALDH1A1 be able to look for uh, a resistant tumors? Would there be actually one possible way to look at it? I think that would be a possible way to look at. Um, but, I, but again, we should, if we are going the statistics way, we should look at the statistics and, and pick out according to what your, your statistics are, uh, are, are mm. telling you. And then go back to look at the function. Um, I, I, if you were to stick in FEM3C or, or similar uh, proteins, there might be other better ones. It's just mm. that you didn't. Yeah. So it's better to have a broad uh, sample set of different proteins to work with the whole mm. um, landscape rather than to focus on one or two. Um, the other thing which I didn't mention is that um, the protein biomarker was able to pick out EGFR mutant lung cancers. And I think that was quite uh, important to, to, to be able to do. Uh, because as I said, these EGFR mutant lung cancers, they don't smoke. There's no, there's no smoking history. So, so they are not the ones that the low-dose CT scans will be recommended for. You'll miss them, essentially. Yeah, so there's, uh, yeah. So there's uh, any question from Tech. So have you ever considered to do any unsupervised analysis to confirm if uh, this is the most consistent differential express protein and if even thinking about pre-post-treatment patient samples follow-up? 
Yes, um, certain. Th th this is a very good question. In fact, we have been thinking about all this. The, we have done unsupervised analysis that shows that this is the most consistent because we, we have done different orthogonal data sets. That means they are independent of each other. Um, and the unsupervised um, analysis was done by Henry Young, who, who he applied quite a lot uh, quite a lot of bioinformatics. I really uh, appreciate his help. It wasn't it wasn't you know I couldn't understand it. Um, the other thing is that uh, pre post treatment patient samples and follow ups. We did I did show some data on the pre the early stage lung cancers where before surgery and then after surgery it seems to go in the right direction. Um, we did start to look at the metastatic patients who were undergoing chemotherapy or EGFR TKIs. The data there, however, is a little bit more messy. You know, some of them were going down, some of them going up. We, we, we weren't quite sure what was what was the interpretation of that. Um, and therefore, and, and we could probably come to a conclusion that when the patient becomes metastatic with a huge tumor burden, things become a lot more complicated. And these three biomarkers may not actually represent a tumor burden in that situation. It's some tumors might, some colonies might be sensitive, some colonies might be resistant, and a mixture of all these will give you your output. So we we don't think it's going to be a good monitoring tool, but as a diagnostic tool, it probably will stand. All right. Yeah. So so thank you very much. We are coming to the end of the hour. Thank you, Prof Go, for your sharing a very informative uh, session on these uh, cancer EVs, both on the diagnostics and also investigating on the role of, uh, of uh, these uh, FEM3C uh, in these uh, cancer resistant. And thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us. Yeah, so uh, Ken, do you have anything to add? No, I would just like to reiterate the thanks um, and, and on behalf of the ISEP community too, to Professor Go. This is a really wonderful presentation and I learned a lot today. Um, and we just want to wish you the very best as you continue this important work. And thanks everybody for joining. Many thanks to Wei Xiong and, and Min Lei. Um, uh, we hope to see you again very soon on another EV Club. Take care, Thank everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, you. Thank you, Prof Go. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ken.